I'm Gillian Martin, and just to sort of clarify, we were talking about the polarising, and I was just yesterday the discussion came up, you know, about the Build Conference in Dublin and the show <coughs> that it's going to be. I think it's going to be okay. Because <laughs> there are many, and I'd be absolutely in that myself. I'm, I'm ADA, and, you know, I reckon PBS is just the car I drive to deliver that, if that makes sense. And if you're in any doubt, you'll see that our chair has provided us with a visual timer to keep us on track. <laughs> um, okay. Just to explain what I am here to do, I work for a large organisation in Ireland. It was one of the first uh, ID providers, and we sort of still have some of those big houses, so we still would have services on three congregate settings. Um, we've developed other services in the intervening 70 years, and each sort of reflects what was in vogue at that time. So we've got a load of variety in what we're trying to roll out PBS into. Um, we started 20 years ago within Callan Institute, and we were sort of tasked with find another way to so sort out these behavioural issues because, you know, the medications and the security rooms just ain't cutting it. So that really was our job. So I'm just going to talk you through some of the ups and downs of the last 20 years so that hopefully you can not fall into the same potholes that we've fallen into. Okay, so our starting point. Back in 1994, we had about 2,000 service users with ID. And so if you extrapolate from Emerson's data, you can estimate that 200, 250 of them had serious behaviours of concern, and a lot more with sort of possibly less intense behaviours. We had a very strong baseline in the medical model, where it's St. John of God Hospitaller Orders, the clue's kind of in the name. Um, so all of our structures, all of our administrations, they're all around medical models and duty of care. Uh, we also had a culture of emergency management training. The insurers, I'm sure it's probably the same here, the insurance agencies came in and said, you have to keep your staff safe, you all must have training in emergency management, or as they called it, behaviour management. And nobody actually got the memo that that's not behaviour management, that's purely emergency management. But for years and years, the services said, oh no, it's okay, we've ticked the behaviour box, we have SCIP or we have CPI. And so it's been a long time banging down that door going, that's great, but that's, that's like having CPR when somebody has a heart attack, but you know, we're not going to manage a heart condition like that. So um, that's where we were coming in at. So back in the day, uh, Brian McLean and uh, our director, Pat Walsh, headed off to the Institute of Applied Behaviour Analysis over with Tom Willis and Gary Lavinia. And they came back essentially as converts to this multi-element behaviour support model. Have you can press that? Yeah, it's, it's just another type of car um, that costs behaviour support. And it's the one we went with. But the idea of using applied behaviour analysis to build good lives and viewing communication as functional and communicative was something that really sat within our values base. We thought, great, St. John of God will stop turning in his grave because we're pretty sure he's not happy with his name. <laughs> so we came back um, with this idea of multi element behaviour support. But we had a huge service to now to try to disseminate that over. So what do we use? We used this particular case training model. So what this is, is over a period of nine months, staff actually come to us and do a module, it's a master's level module, in multi animal behaviour support. They don't just learn it, they do it. It's an applied training, so they actually take a service user that they're supporting, they conduct a fun functional assessment, they make a plan and they implement it for six months and then we send them on their way and say, job well done. Um, so it's, it's a brilliant system for a large organisation because we have upwards of 250 requiring behaviour support plans and we have three behaviour specialists in Calvary <coughs> Institute. So. The win-win kept going. It was on-the-job training, so it wasn't taking people out of their workplace. It was using live referrals. So for a large organisation, they're actually able to clear their backlog of referrals and in a very, very efficient way. You know, if they had sent those referral letters into us and we sent out a letter going, wait eight weeks until we initially even review you. So it's a very fast way to deliver services. There's a generalisation of skills. So not just between staff, but also to different service users because they're now being supported with a better understanding of their needs. Solutions are provided in situ. So we haven't had to transfer anybody out into a specialist unit. I think we've probably had two over the years, and that was primarily due to mental health issues, and another one where it came up as a need out of their assessment. Um, but for the most part, if the person is happy in their home, we can do this in their home. 
Also, because these plans are developed by the local teams in the person's home, there's good adherence, there's good maintenance, staff are taking responsibility for them. Plus, there's really good contextual fit because the interventions are designed for that environment specifically. So, it's fabulous. At least that's what we thought. Got a great job done. So we thought we'd better sit down and actually take a look at it, just to make sure it was job done. Um, interestingly, and I just brought this up to link it back to the last paper, where the staff were coming from, their own professional backgrounds, again, very much mirrors who's in the field of PBS. So it's of every layer going up from frontline staff to the actual behaviour practitioners now. You can see that we have to find some way to marry this interdisciplinary problem with the science of ABA. Um, so I think that's going to be a challenge for us. We looked at, well, first of all, did the students enjoy the course? And also, how relevant did they feel it was to their work? What we found was that, well, at the beginning, it's kind of hard work. Module two is function assessment. Real pain in the ass. Um, did not enjoy that. But you'll see that, really, this is when the plan kicked in, when they actually launched their own behavior <coughs> support, support plans with the person they're supporting. And that's when they went, yeah, this is really doing something. Um, at the end, it started to dip. <coughs> Uh, that was either the final assessment looming, or I'm wondering if it had been six months implementation, and was, was there a bit of habituation going on and the gloss was starting to wear off, and they're like, yeah, okay, fair enough, we've done this now. Um, the relevance scores stayed fairly high throughout, so that was nice. From the get-go, they said, okay, we see how this applies, we see that this <coughs> is necessary. Had to be visual timer gone. We're good to go. Okay, uh, Brian McLean also looked at this study in a slightly more formal, he actually published and got to write down doing properly, he found significant improvement in 77% of cases at an average follow-up of 22 months. So that's good results coming out, that's effectiveness. Uh, he also found that the behaviour support plans designed by direct caregivers were at least as effective as those designed by psychologists. So we can either take that as a yay or an oops, we're in trouble. But um, either way, we'll, we'll go with it. Um, so again, we said brilliant, it's definitely working huge, flat on the back. Then in 2007 we said, right, let's audit and see what the staying power of them is like. So we put out a bat signal to sort of try to find the, we knew there's about 300 plans out there developed through this style of training. So, so we put out a bat signal to sort of see if we could find out information on maintenance, evaluation and clinical governance on them. And we got about a third back who had consent to share the information with us. Good news. No behaviours were reported to have disimproved. We are brilliant. Um, so, at least if we're not doing brilliantly, at least we're not screwing up. So that was the sort of thing we took from that. Uh, and again, we were getting some fairly nice results. And bear in mind, this is over a 15-year period. So these plans, this is a long-range view of it. Big concern, 40% missing data. Just didn't know where it was. And bear in mind that this was the third who were playing ball with us. So we didn't want to know what state the other two thirds of the plans were in. <coughs> um, we found some other concerns coming up as well. 63% didn't know if formal consent was granted. So, and again, bear in mind, 15 years ago, you know, we weren't always too fussed about that thing back in the day. So, um, only 53% were able to confirm if the person said your plan was in place. And I'll talk about that later. I see George in the background doing the hero worshipping here going, I've referenced you. That was really a schoolboy error because I've cocked it up. Um, only 18% of plans were in place with active review. So there was 82% of these plans were just winging it. Uh, nearly half just didn't know where the plan was. They're like, oh, it could be in a basement, in storage, somewhere, literally. And we gave them two weeks' notice, or actually it was three weeks' notice these interviews, so we didn't just parachute in. 20% um, could produce a plan that had an assessment and hypothesis of function. Uh, so 80% we weren't even sure if those plans were, were functionally based. Um, and that was brought home to me recently, I was in a meeting and they said, but we're scoring you know, 82% of implementation, why isn't it working? I was like, if it's 82% of rubbish, um, to put it politely, you know, that's why it's not working. So we really need to make sure these plans were not robust, they were not rigorous, they were not necessarily clinically valid. So we'd obviously lost the run of ourselves somewhere. We were so proud of our training program that we kind of started to neglect some of these other areas. And often what you heard in a service, if a behavioural issue came up, they said, oh, send them to Callum, do the MEBS course. You know, they didn't actually think about, well, what's this person 
need. Um, so we put a huge amount of focus on this and it was carrying far too much. That was good for it. So we thought we'd better do some, make some changes. Those three main areas, we looked at our training, so that, as I say, is our primary sort of way of getting the information out there. We looked at our clinical governance, and we also looked at the way we view behavior support. So, first thing we did for the particular case training was that we moved the focus from the student back onto the service user. We kind of forgotten that in all our busyness to you know get accredited with the professional bodies and get you know in the universities, we'd actually forgotten about the service user at the end of this. So if a student didn't turn up <coughs> for a training day, we got on the blower the next day to their supervisor. And not to berate them, you think that's a verse, but it wasn't to berate them, it was to say, is the service user okay? You know, are they going to miss out because the person didn't attend? Or if the a student couldn't finish the course, we wrote to the clinical director and the service director saying, it is your responsibility to ensure continuity of PBS services to that person. You know, this isn't your student on a course, this is your actual clinical model, and it just happens to be the way you're rolling it out. And literally, from the moment we put that first letter in the post, there was about 10 messages on the machine the next day. Going, When's the next training day? What do we need to do to support this person to get through? So once we put the responsibility back on the powers that be, we suddenly noticed a big difference. Now we have what we call a scope of practice agreement. So before the training even starts, we get the student to sign it, the line manager to, to sign it, and the clinical supervisor to sign it, to also sort of acknowledge what their role is and that they're committed to seeing this through, committed to providing the service user with the supports. The big issue now, and again, I'm sure it's the same over here, is, is staff just can't get released to go on training. So we don't have the luxury of those nice three-day introductory courses, or even a one-day introductory course anymore. So we've been developing online learning options. So we have a, an e-learning program up and running that we're really hoping to sort of squeeze a bit more out of now. We're doing a lot more by way of blended learning. So you know, we've created a YouTube channel, and we'll, have, we'll use that in our trainings and say, okay, go back and have a look at that. And they are publicly available, we haven't locked them down, so you're more than welcome to give us some feedback. So we're only just starting that, literally, last month. Uh, we also have a Facebook page that we use to disseminate information. And I've actually put the slides from this up, if you're interested on it. So the link is on the Facebook page there, just to show it is current. Um, we're also trying to do much more training in context. So trying to do bite-sized pieces. An example would be uh, work we're doing with some teaching assistants at the moment. And we only have them for one hour every two weeks. And we're thinking, what the hell can we do in that? So we've broken it down, and we pick a topic each time. So it could be the sensory environment, how to manage transition, in this case, predictability and structure. We give them the top four or five principles, the things to always have in your mind. We set them to do some learning tasks, you know, a bit of experiential learning, and then we ask them to set their classroom goals for that week. And say, okay, what are you going to commit to just focusing on for the next two weeks? Then we print this up, we sort of personalise it then, print it up and we stick it in their classroom so even if we're not there, we're there. And then we come back two weeks later and we say, okay, how did that go for you? So we're trying to just really get bite-sized training with follow-up. That's the big thing. And I was interested to hear Peter Baker talking about the video reflection piece. I'm going to be straight on to Moscow for that. Uh, we looked at the clinical governance. So now we have the local teams taking responsibility for the plans. So those 300 plans that are out there, we're bringing them back into the fold. And we're ensuring that any new plans that are developed are actually rooted through the multidisciplinary team. So as Callum, we won't take a referral unless it actually comes through the local psychologist. Whereas we used to have staff that could go, can you come and see someone? So we go in, do an assessment, and then it just drifted off. And the local psychologist is going, what, what the hell's going on? Were you even here? So we're now rooting everything through the MDT. Uh, we were talking there about the lack of supervision. What was that, 39% of practitioners actually had supervision, which is very, very scary. Um, so we're trying to provide that supervision where appropriate uh, and offering that. Um, so both in group formats and in individual formats. So we're, we're we've been sort of trying to get in with the BACB so we can offer that. Um, my colleague is a registered clinical psychologist, so she's offering it sort of through that. So we're trying to sort of cover all bases to support the staff. We also provide support to frontline staff. We've developed these sort of drop-in clinics. 
So in a service, I, they know I'll always be there the first Wednesday of the month, between two and four with a cup of tea and a good biscuits. And they're just free to drop by, have a chat. Um, we have to be very careful, and we've had to find our way with this. We can't provide any clinical input at those sessions, because it's out of context, we haven't got consent. So we've made it very clear that we are there to support the staff in best practice. So they'll come to us and say, this has happened, and we'll say, okay, what about the complaints procedure, or maybe that does work for <coughs> a referral, you know, send that in to us. Um, or keep some data on that for a while. We won't actually offer clinical advice about the service user. We'll just give best practice advice to the staff. Um, but they're, they're getting a lot of comfort out of it because they know we'll be back. I think it's that consistency is really paying off. Um, we'll change the way we actually view behaviour support. It's a bit of a change of perspective. can often make things look a bit better. Previously, this was our, um, I suppose, behaviour management strategy, if you can call it that. We had psychiatry from our medical mandate. We had emergency management from our insurance <coughs> mandate. We had PBS with no mandate. And hence, it was sort of often the icing on the cake. You know, you can use that with the mild behaviours if we have the time. Um, and then person-centred planning sort of came in on Vogue and we got LinkedIn, so that became a mandate. So that often got pushed into the, the responses. Um, but it was a complete mishmash. There was no structure in how these were applied. So now, and this is where I'm going, oh dear God, let me have got it right. Um, this, is where, <laughs> this is where we borrowed heavily from the school by positive behaviour support literature. So we're assuming the person-centred planning is in place. And if a referral comes in, the first thing we do is we say, let's get a person centred plan. And if that's cruddy, go back, do that again. Then we can talk about behavioural issues. But you know, if that's not there, it's probably just a perfectly, it's probably not a behaviour per se, it's just a perfectly natural backlash against a cruddy life. Um, then we look at the universal interventions, so that sort of the global things that we're doing, that we give the staff training, we're setting positive goals, for example, with some of the schools we're working with. Then we have more targeted group interventions. So we might be working on hot spots. We know that the transport time is always difficult, so we go in and just have a closer look at that. Um, and then that frees us up for the intensive individual intervention. And what we're finding is that this is, allows us so much more flexibility, because we know this is a great place for frontline staff to come in. <coughs> we know that this, and sometimes even here, is a good place where the, possibly those um, practitioners who don't necessarily have all the skills we'd like, but they're still perfectly competent to work here, possibly. So it gives us a way to sort of develop a structure with what we have. So our current challenges. What do we need to provide, both from a legal perspective and from best practice? Legally now, in Ireland, it's very clear we have to provide positive behaviour support. As we've been discussing, it doesn't mean we know what positive behaviour support is. So uh, there's still a lot of wiggle room in terms of... Uh, somebody was saying it yesterday, it was Carl, and... He was saying, you know, people are just doing what they always did and now they're just calling it positive behaviour support. So we need to get more rigorous about what it is we're applying. So we're looking at things like competent environment <coughs> surveys and other ways to sort of objectively measure. So if any of these ideas, I would love to hear them. We need to build teams that can deliver a good clinical and ethical service. So those, uh, we, and the problem we have at the moment is a lot of those practitioners who don't have the backup or the professional kudos, and, but they're there and we need to support them. And they also have 20 years of fantastic knowledge behind them. You know, we don't want to lose that. Um, we need to, to support new staff that are coming in with ABA training. Because 20 years ago, there wasn't any ABA training in Ireland. 10 years ago, there wasn't much. Um, so this is only a very new thing. So we're catching up. We also want to create a culture of positive behaviour support. Oh my goodness, have I just not been looking? Okay, one minute. <laughs> Creating a culture of positive behaviour support. So it's tripping off everybody's tongues. We, we're all on the same page. Right, so you've had highs, had lows. This is just my sort of my take homes. For if you don't want to completely, you lose your sanity working in a service this size. Start small. So keep it. Pilot projects, keep it manageable. Uh, think team. You don't need all those skills in one person. So maybe you take that practitioner with 20 years of fantastic experience and you match them with a the new ABA graduate. You put in a bit of external clinical supervision, bam, you've got a fantastic team. So it doesn't need to be all in one person. Select champions. Make friends um, and push the open doors. No point in, in bashing your head against them. Be informed. What's going on elsewhere? And that's going to lead on to what Jonathan's talking about. We're often on our own, so we need to find ways to access information. <coughs> Be true. 
don't get compromised. Because if we don't hold ourselves accountable, who else can? But in that, stay flexible. Stay very, very flexible. Because you're going to encounter the issues. <coughs> we can't close the doors on the people who need services. So that is, the, as I say, my, my sanity saving tips. Thank you. <laughs>